Hey everybody, good morning. Pastor John here from New Life Church in Owaka, Washington. This is the message for Sunday, July 30th, 2023. And we are still in our Clash of Cultures series. If you are just now joining us, this is week three. Week one, we looked at the uh, what was going on in Ephesus at the time when uh, Paul was there. We looked at the book of Acts, and then uh, and what we learned is that Ephesus was dominated by worship of the false god or goddess Artemis. And Paul uh, addresses that when he's there, and then he also addresses aspects of that when he writes to uh, when he writes the letter Ephesians that we read about, which is to the church of Ephesus. And so when we look at the clash of cultures, week one, it was talking about this false goddess, and, uh, and this is what's going on in, in Ephesus. But last week, we kind of pulled the mask off of Artemis a little bit. We found out that really the problem is the enemy, the devil, and that it's his deception that's drawing people away. And there's so much overlap when we look at what he's doing in Ephesus at the time of the uh, book of Ephesians, but also now in our culture and the things that we're dealing with on a regular basis. And so last week's we were focused more on us and how we shouldn't be necessarily clashing with those who are struggling with a simple lifestyle, but instead we should be looking at them as a ministry opportunity, as a rescue mission, a place where we should be going and, and helping pull back the, uh, the deception and, and let them see what's going on, that the enemy is at work in their life and that he's trying to destroy them. And that really should be our focus, not so much a clash, but instead an opportunity to love. Now this week, we're going to be looking at a completely different clash of cultures, but it's one that I think is near and dear to my heart and also will probably be very good news for most if not all of you so if you're ready let's go ahead and jump into ephesians chapter 3 i'm picking up in verse 1 paul writes when i think of all this i paul a prisoner of christ jesus for the benefit of you gentiles assuming by the way that you know god gave me special responsibility of extending his grace to you Gentiles. <laughs> Good old Paul. He's never the least bit full of himself, is he? Special responsibilities. <clears throat> Actually, this is something that should be considered very special. And this particular responsibility that Paul has is something truly exceptional. And it's one that I think that we should consider not only important, but will ultimately lead to the situation that Paul finds himself in here, that he is a prisoner for Christ. And so when I'm kind of teasing about maybe Paul being a little bit full of himself, the truth is uh, Paul most times run around, and he'll see it again in just a second, saying, I'm like the worst. Why, why in the world would God choose me? I'm the worst sinner of all. And he really struggled a lot also with the guilt of his past. I know some of you struggle with the guilt of your past. But look, when God is using you, sometimes you're able to speak with authority because he's given you a message and the Holy Spirit operating through you allows you to deliver that message in a way that's truly outside of your character. And so I want to make sure that I encourage you, even starting now, to make sure that you are filled with the Holy Spirit and that you're allowing him to speak through you. And as we look at Paul's situation here, where he's a prisoner, he is still able to write with extreme authority. And that's something that's important as we move forward, is that it's not just Paul speaking, but he is speaking with the authority of Christ through the Holy Spirit. Let's continue and bring this all together. Verse 3 says, As I briefly wrote earlier, God himself revealed his mysterious plan to me, as you read what I have written, you will understand my insight into this plan regarding Christ. God did not reveal it to previous generations, but now by his spirit, he has revealed it to his holy apostles and prophets. Now, at first glance, this looks like some kind of Gnosticism, special responsibility, mysterious plan, like, ooh, the suspense. Come on, Paul, where are we going with this? Well, the Gnostics were never satisfied 
with the aspects of salvation. There was always something extra. They had to add some special revelation or secret knowledge. There was always something additional that no one else had access to. They were the only ones who could provide the real answer. But what Paul is writing about here is sort of a reverse Gnosticism. See, he's not saying that he, uh, this plan, because it wasn't revealed to previous generations, it now makes it the only way. What he's saying is that this has been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit now. It's applicable for now, meaning right where he was at that moment. And it wasn't just revealed to Paul alone. That's how we also know this would be the opposite of Gnosticism. It wasn't one prophet or one apostle with a particular message. Instead, the Holy Spirit was revealing this message to multiple apostles and prophets. And I want us to go ahead and look at some examples. So in Matthew 28, Jesus gives us the Great Commission. He says in verse 18, Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now, okay, arguably, you could maybe look at what Jesus is saying here, especially if you're one of his disciples, and think that he's telling you to go and, and find the Jews who are in all nations and, and make them disciples. Now, I agree, that's, that's a stretch, but it, I guess it's possible that that would be the case. But before his ascension into heaven, Jesus says this in Acts 1, verse 8, <clears throat> But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Now here it is again, and perhaps I think a little bit clearer than it was in Matthew. Jerusalem. Okay, Jews. Got it. Judea. That's easy. More Jews. Samaria. Hey, wait a minute. You mean like you want us to pick out the Jews who are living in Samaria? No, you, you mean the Samaritans too. Okay, well at least they're, they're half Jewish, right? And to the ends of the earth. Hey, wait a minute, Jesus. To the ends of the earth. There, there aren't any Jews there yet. So it's pretty clear from Jesus' final instruction, take the gospel to the whole world. But Jesus' followers weren't quite ready initially to understand that, with the exception of just a couple. They were fine, upstanding Jewish young men who'd been hanging out with Jesus, who was also a fine, upstanding Jewish young man. And these Jewish young men followed the Jewish law and the Jewish customs. And so the Holy Spirit had to come to them and make it very clear. And in Acts 10, that's exactly what he does. The Holy Spirit reveals this special plan that Paul's talking about to another one of his disciples. So in Acts 10, verse 9, it says, The next day Cornelius' messengers were nearing the town. Peter went up on the flat roof to pray. It was about noon, and he was hungry. But while a meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw the sky open, and something like a large sheet was let down by its four corners. And the sheet were all sorts of animals, reptiles, and birds. Then a voice said to him, Get up, Peter, kill them, and eat them. No, Lord, Peter declared, I've never eaten anything that our Jewish laws have declared impure and unclean. But the voice spoke again, Do not call something unclean if God has made it clean. The same vision was repeated three times. Then the sheet was suddenly pulled up to heaven. Now, Peter was very perplexed. What could this vision mean? Just then, the men sent by Cornelius found Simon's house. Standing outside the gate, they asked if a man named Simon Peter was staying there. Meanwhile, as Peter was puzzling over the vision, the Holy Spirit said to him, Three men have come looking for you. Get up, go downstairs, and go with them without hesitation. Don't worry, for I have sent them. So Peter went down and said, I am the man you're looking for. Why have you come? They said, We were sent by Cornelius, a Roman officer. He is a devout and God-fearing man. 
well respected by all the Jews. A holy angel instructed him to summon you to his house so that he can hear your message. So Peter invited the men to stay for the night. The next day, he went with them, accompanied by some of the brothers from Joppa. They arrived in Caesarea the following day. Cornelius was waiting for them, and he called together his relatives and close friends. As Peter entered his home, Cornelius fell at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter pulled him up and said, Stand up, I'm a human being just like you. So they talked together and went inside, where many others were assembled. Peter told them, You know it's against our laws for a Jewish man to enter a Gentile home like this or to associate with you. But God has shown me that I should no longer think of anyone as impure or unclean. So I came without objection as soon as I was sent for. Now tell me, why have you sent for me? So Peter got the message. And on he got the message on the special plan. Now he has the special insight that Paul's been talking about. And now Paul is making it known to the rest of us in Ephesians 3. Back to Ephesians 3. Let's go to verse 6. And this is God's plan. Both Gentiles and Jews who believe the good news share equally in the riches inherited by God's children. When we talk about a clash of cultures, this is massive. That sentence, that one sentence alone is a, is a complete change. This is a paradigm shift for anyone who's been in the Jewish faith. This is God's plan. Both Gentiles and Jews who believe the good news share equally in the riches inherited by God's children. Both are part of the same body. Both enjoy the promise of blessing because they belong to Christ Jesus. By God's grace and mighty power, I have given the privilege of serving I have been given the privilege of serving him by spreading this good news. Though I am the least deserving of all God's people, he graciously gave me the privilege of telling the Gentiles about the endless tra treasures available to them through Christ. I was chosen to explain to everyone this mysterious plan that God, the creator of all things, had kept secret from the beginning. God's purpose in all of this was to use the church to display his wisdom in its rich variety to all the unseen rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was his eternal plan, which he carried out through Christ Jesus our Lord. Because of Christ and our faith in him, we can now come boldly and confidently into God's presence. So please don't lose heart because of my trials here. I am suffering for you so that you should feel honored. You see, up until this time, Gentiles were never really part of the plan. It was possible for a Gentile to convert to Judaism, but Gentiles were never, ever really fully accepted into the Jewish culture. Even after putting their faith in God and making sacrifices and following the law, they were still ostracized to a degree. They were never considered real Jews or, uh, or even the children of God. In fact, even when they would go to, we'll call it church, but when they would go to the synagogue or the temple, they couldn't sit wherever they wanted. It was very much like being relegated to the back of the bus in, uh, during the civil rights movement here in the, in, in the U.S. There was a separation. They had to sit in a certain place. They couldn't go into certain places, even in what we would call the sanctuary. They couldn't go to just sit wherever they wanted. And as Peter mentioned here, or mentioned a minute ago in Acts 10, he's talking to Cornelius, and, and he says, I, I wouldn't even go into your home. But this is a man who has converted. His faith is in God. He's well respected by the Jews, but Peter wouldn't even go into his home because they weren't really allowed to, even if they were technically fellow believers. Do you hear that difference? That's a big difference. So you want to talk about a clash of cultures? That's where Paul's message is now matching the instructions that Jesus gave his disciples in the Great Commission. And it matches the vision that the Holy Spirit gave to Peter. Take the gospel to everyone, even the Gentiles. 
This is good news. Like I said earlier, this is good news literally for all of us. And then, still in Ephesians 3, Paul changes gears just a little bit. Down in verse 14, he says, When I think of all this, I fall to my knees, and I pray to the Father, the creator of everything in heaven and on earth. I pray that from his glorious and limited resources, he will empower you with the inner strength through his spirit. Who? You. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully. Then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and the power that comes from God. Now all glory to God, who is able, through his mighty power, at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Glory to him in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Now at first glance, this almost looks as though it's like the end of the letter to the Ephesian church, uh, or, uh, <clears throat> or maybe it's a different thought than what we were talking about before, and actually neither of those things are true. Uh, good Lord willing, I will be back next week with more from the book of Ephesians, where we will pick up, most likely in chapter 4, as we continue. But here, it's, it's becoming clear that in the writing, the Holy Spirit is asking us, to, make, to allow Christ to make his home in our hearts, that we should allow Christ to be in us. We really, he really wants us to understand God's love. And the only way that's going to happen is when we have our eyes opened to what Christ has already done for us through his, through his creation of us, through his uh, plans that he made for us when he made us that he would die for us. And all of that is just a little bit of understanding who God is and how much he loves us. Then it, it really truthfully is how wide, how long, how high, how deep this love is for us. And so if we can ever really begin to understand God's love for us, then we can begin to understand his love for everyone else, too, Jew and Gentile. And remember, like we talked about last week, we're all sinners. So when you see people who are living in a sinful lifestyle, you have to remember God loves them, too. And he doesn't want them to continue on a path of destruction. He wants them to be his disciples. This isn't some grand Scheme. This isn't some truly, uh, un, un, it's not some concept that we can't understand. God wants us to understand that his love for us is genuine and real. And that that same love applies to everyone else that we see. God wants them to leave behind their sin and their destruction and follow him. And so we have a responsibility to bring that message the same way that Paul was bringing that message to the Gentiles. We have a responsibility to bring the message, the gospel, the good news to anyone who will listen and to help them grow in the Holy Spirit. And then we should also seek him and allow the Holy Spirit to fill us to operate through us so that we can understand his instructions the same way Peter did when he was on the roof and the Holy Spirit said, three men are here. Go with them without hesitation. Well, okay, Holy Spirit. Well, they turned out to be Gentiles. Peter didn't question that. He simply obeyed the Holy Spirit. We have to be able to find the courage, that inner strength, to take the message to the masses. If the Holy Spirit gives us a message, then we need to 
deliver that message. Listen, if you've received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, then the heart of the Great Commission should already be your heart. It should be what drives you daily to use your resources that the Lord has provided to you to reach the lost. I'm talking about, yeah, your financial resources, but I'm also talking about the skills, the technology that God has given you. You should be using that to reach the lost, the gifts, the talents, the words that you speak. You should find a way to deliver the gospel to any who will listen. Obey the Holy Spirit. Use the gifts that he's provided to you. And let him operate through you. If you've received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, there shouldn't be anything holding you back. Now, if you have not yet received the Holy Spirit, if you haven't been filled by the Holy Spirit, uh, like it talks about in Acts chapter 2, then I invite you to pursue baptism in the Holy Spirit like we read about, not just in Acts chapter 2, but at the end of Acts chapter 10. When Peter took the gospel message to the Gentile Cornelius and his friends, it says in Acts 10, 44, even as Peter was saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell upon those who were listening to the message. The Jewish believers who came with Peter were amazed that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles too. For they heard them speaking in other tongues and praising God. You should pursue baptism in the Holy Spirit because once you are filled with the Holy Spirit, you'll have the power to take the truth of the gospel to Jerusalem, to Judea, to Samaria, and throughout the world. And that's what Jesus has called all of us to do. Because his love for us, yeah, it's, it's massive and it's huge and it's awesome. But it's not just for you. It's for the Gentile too. It's also for those who are walking in destruction and they need to be rescued. And that's the job the Holy Spirit wants to do through you. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your love for us. Thank you for continuing to love us even when we were still your enemies. But Lord, because of your love for us, we can also see that your love for everyone else is just as genuine and just as real. Show us, Lord, how we can take your message to other people. Holy Spirit, operate through us. Use our gifts, our strengths, our talents. Uh, use our weaknesses and our testimonies. Use whatever you can f from us to be able to reach the loss. Because we know it's not your heart that any should perish. And Lord, for those who are filled with the Holy Spirit, I ask that you give them courage, an inner strength to continue to know you better and know you more, but also boldly profess the gospel to any who would listen. And for those who are watching today who are not yet filled with the Holy Spirit, I ask that just like it happened in Cornelius' home, that you pour out your Holy Spirit on them right now, that they will be filled with the Holy Spirit, baptized in his power and in, and in your presence, and that you will, Lord, fill them up so that they can begin to overflow with this message of the gospel. This message of love that you're trying to convey to the world, let it just boil out of them and overflow in, into all aspects and areas of their life. Let them grow closer to you daily and let them use this amazing power that you are giving to them right now to be able to reach the lost. Use all of us, Lord, to deliver the message of the gospel to the Jew, to the Gentile, to those who think they are saved and those who know they are not. Let us be your ministers of reconciliation in our communities and throughout the world. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks for joining us today. Hope to see you next week when we pick up with uh, Lesson 4, Clash of Cultures.